Dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor, as you heard, to tell you a Swedish saga. A saga that led to good results and a cost-efficient healthcare. There are many truths and many different ways of telling it. But like many sagas, it has a story with, of course, exaggerations and a black and white narration. Unlike sagas, it has no and it all ended happily. As many of us know, quality improvement is an everlasting work. This presentation is named, as you heard, the birthplace of quality improvement. Everybody knows that giving birth is a hard work. It's a lifelong project and a lifelong duty. So taking care of this baby, providing her with a safe birthplace is nothing against taking care of this mess. That is the very same baby as a teenager. This is the daily mess that my teenage daughter leaves behind her. What you see here is our kitchen. In the morning, it's left in good order. In the afternoon, it's found in this way. There are tracks of baking, cooking, messing it all up and leaving open doors. It demands a lot of teenage effort to close the doors. <laughs> so parenthood has no ending. It's a hard work. It's a lifelong duty. It's though very rewarding. The same goes for quality improvement. Even if Sweden is its birthplace, it's an ongoing work. And you have tried to be humble, and that is what I will try today, even if my task is to point out the good results and the bright sides. Evidently, there are many areas left for improvement. So, I divided my presentation into three sections. The history, you always have to look back to understand what is the context and which are the cornerstones. There are the way we make improvements or do our quality work, and lastly, the challenges. Cornerstones. Firstly, Sweden has a long history working with public health policy. Sweden directly introduced that public health was cross-sectional and a matter of having health in all policies. This fan-shaped diagram describes our policy. Public health emerged from all areas in society, and we know for a fact that it's linked to labor market, education, housing, as well as social services and healthcare. So, the long history of public health means that schools now have to learn their kids how to swim, it's in the legislation, that we have a regulation on helmets, on biking, and also have planned for safe playgrounds everywhere. This public health policy has also led to innovations and new and safer ways to promote public health. I want to link these good results on tobacco to the public health policy in Sweden. Tobacco kills nearly 6 million people every year, of whom more than 5 million are directly from tobacco use. Tobacco is a major risk factor for at least two of the leading causes of premature mortality. Cardiovascular diseases and cancer, increasing the risk of heart attack, lung cancer, among others. The proportion of daily smokers in the adult population varies greatly. Rates are lowest in Sweden, as you see here, Iceland, Mexico and Australia. Sweden stands well compared to other countries, but the development over the years is also very positive, as you see here. This is the amount of the population that smokes in Sweden. As you see, we have a challenge when it comes to equity. The higher the education, the healthier. But still, the curve is going downwards. So, tobacco was one example of our how, oh, on how our public health policy has affected our habits and health. Another is obesity in the population. Obesity is a known risk factor for numerous health problems, including hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, etc. 
The rise in overweight and obesity is a major public health concern. The prevalence of obesity, which present even greater health risks than overweight, varies six folds, folds across OECD countries, from a low 5% in Japan and Korea to over 32% in Mexico and US. Sweden has good figures here as well, as you see from this graph. Across OECD countries, 90% of the adult population are obese. Sweden public health policy has been considered so successful that when trying to quantify the results in this article in EuroHealth, a journal from the WHO Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, the article stated that if all countries in Europe adapted the policies that were in place in Sweden, then almost two million deaths could have been averted. 750,000 from reductions in cardiovascular diseases alone. This study included 10 areas from hypertension treatment, cancer screening, to use of tobacco and road safety. A really crucial cornerstone in the Swedish healthcare and society is the relationship between the state, the public welfare system, and the individual. It's built on trust. And it's a common understanding that the responsibility for health is divided between the individual and the state. I would claim that it includes a silent agreement on that health is not only a private matter, it's also a matter for the state. In fact, the state is welcome to interfere the healthcare system as the most important part of the welfare system have a harmony-oriented relationship with the citizen. Our way of institutionalizing the healthcare does not stress a conflict-oriented conception of citizenship. It's actually quite blurred when it comes to accountability and division of responsibility. The Swedish institutions involve more directly and collective ways of claiming accountability and the institutions carry a harmony-oriented conception of citizenship. In line with that we have no rights to claim as patients, but only duties for the, states, for the state and the regions to deliver healthcare services. So, health is a public matter here in Sweden. This is how it could look like when the state targets the health issue. I actually found this in the cellar of my national agency. It's from 1957. Uh, it uh, was financed by money from the government that were directed to the national agency. And it, of course, as you see, it's for preventing cavities. Posters were made and information folders. And this poster shows Sweet Tooth Bob or Pellesnask in Swedish. The aim was to get a citizen to feel responsible for his dental health. But Sweet Tooth Bob consumes candy and turns to Filthy Bob <laughs> with cavities in his teeth. This kind of information, or shall I call it propaganda, has a long history in Sweden. It shows that health is something that not entirely lies within the private sphere. I found some other posters also in my cellar. Do let the sun shine on your kid as you can see on the first poster. Prevent accidents. This contract will still remain today. It's probably something that supports good health, but of course, over time, public health messages tend to evolve with increased knowledge. It's still advisable to keep matches, as you see here, and medicines out of reach for children, but I doubt that more exposure to the sun for small babies will qualify today. <laughs> This kind of health information is related to what countries now have introduced and are on the way of introducing now in the 20th century. That is of plain packaging. That is also a way of interfering in the name of public health. That has become accepted in many countries and the notion of plain packages can be understood as a standardization of the looks of the package to the benefit of informing on risks of using tobacco. Plain packaging has become accepted in a number of countries, Australia, Ireland, France, United Kingdom, Norway, and it's on 
its way yet in other countries. Recently, a Swedish national inquiry has argued, based on international experience, that implementing legislation on plain packages would be in the interest of public health. This inquiry has argued that plain packages would help decrease tobacco use in Sweden as well. However, there are still some outstanding issues related to, to, to constitutional issues here in Sweden. So, cornerstones are the public health policy, the contract between the citizens and the state, uh, and the third cornerstone is, of course, as you know, registries. And it all started a long time ago, back with Carl von Linné, professor of medicine at Uppsala University, a Swedish scientist that laid ground for the classification in health through his classification of nature. Professor Carl von Linné published his Genera Morborum 1763. Linné argued that medical doctors should gain knowledge and greater awareness of diseases if they applied the same system and classification botanists used to categorize, divide into groups, species, and families. The Swedish cause of death register, which uses the classifications, spans back several centuries. And in this picture, you can see an example from the national public statistics dating back to 1859. The picture being a bit blur, blur, it's an annex to a royal announcement on the notification of information when a death certificate is declared with the purpose of achieving reliable statistics and causes of death. Based on the above, the agency preceding the National Board for Health and Welfare announced a circular to all medical doctors in the country to be used when declaring causes of death. And you see it there in the, in the slide. In this circular, there were specific formats to be used for death certificates, and what is interesting, a nomenclature to be used when deciding on the cause of the death. So you see, people were really wise back then. And today, we have more than 100 quality registries. It took many years to build reliable registries. Development has been fast. Patient reported outcome measures, patient reported experience message have been added to almost all registries now, and today they form a solid cornerstone in our improvement work. So, three cornerstones, and aligned with what I said um, health in all policies, partnership, registries, and aligned with what I said now. You are in Sweden, and that gives me the right to give you good advice on health. So, we had a yoga session, but in Sweden we tend to sit too much, so now it's time just to stand up for a minute. So, yeah, yeah, just um, do the shoulder thing. <laughs> we do them both. Since it's morning and I know that you, some of you were up late yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is enough. Just. This will uh, probably increase the uh, time we are, the total time of our lifespan here for a couple of hours maybe. It's so good to stand. So, I will come back then to uh, how we make improvements. That was a more difficult section. Um, cornerstones might take a while to build, as you saw, some 300 years. You have the registries, the consent and the trust from the population, and the health in all policies perspective. It would not render success if you didn't use those investments wisely. So how do we use them? First, registries. They were mainly used by professionals until just 15 years ago. Then we launched a policy to make them transparent. We had the same debate that all WHO and OECD members had. When the ranking came, 2000, data was not good enough, data could mis be misinterpreted, data could steer the system in the wrong way, data was not covering all of the system, data was not up to date, the objections were many, 
and the discussion was really intense here in Sweden. But transparency as such moved forward in society, so did the discussion within the healthcare sector. The decision was to increase transparency and to involve the patients and the public in the outcome data and other results, and also to compare mainly yourself to earlier years, but also yourself to others. What we know and have facts about is that measuring and exposing data, being transparent, comparing data, is a solid driver for improvement in the healthcare sector. It leads to better performance, but not only that. It also leads to reduced gaps, increased equity, and reduced gap between the best performer and the worst. Let me show you some examples. Here you see a graph that illustrates ischemic heart disease. Much of the mortality from ischemic heart disease is avoidable by either medical interventions or living conditions or lifestyle changes. The circles are the regions by size. What I want to show you here is both the falling curve. Healthcare has been successful in reducing mortality in all regions, but more interesting is that the outcome performance has over the years become more equal when it comes to results, as you see. The gaps are reduced. The difference that we're linked to geography reduce, reduces over the years, and comparing with others, and guided by that, trying to analyze and look for explanations why you are not performing equally good, and then try to do it in another and a better way, has led to this positive development. Another example, stroke death. You have the same curve here, reduced differences, and overall better performance over the years. The small circles are also here, the regions in Sweden, the big ones, the larger regions, and 21 circles in every year. This indicator focuses on the quality of acute treatment of myocardial infarction. Same chain here, reduced regional differences and better performance by all regions. This graph describes drug therapy that has a high priority in the Swedish uh, clinical guidelines for patients with heart failure. Improvements and reduced gaps link to what we believe the support from knowing how you perform compared to others and taking it into action. Last graph, avoidable hospital admissions for persons with diabetes and mortality from cardiovascular disease. It illustrates the same progress for men and women. So, enough of examples. To improve our transparent way of making performance assessment, we also add cost analysis from a national level. This is something we will do more often in the future. In this graph, you see the progress on national level when it comes to day surgery on prolapse it has increased and cost has been reduced at the same time. Here you see it on a regional level. In most regions, day surgery has, incru uh, has increased over the years. The variation is, as you see, between regions, huge. Day surgery gives the patient shorter visit at the hospital and a shorter period of recovery which means that this is something that every region should strive for. We made a cost analysis and saw that if every region performed as the best region in the top here, 82% day surgery, we could save 26 million Swedish crowns. This is, of course, an estimation, but it makes it worthwhile to strive for progress. Apart from the cost analysis on a national level, we break it down. Here you see the guide to every region in Sweden on what they can expect in savings, in actual money, if they performed as the best performer. For this region, where we are right now, they can expect to save 5 million Swedish crowns, half a million euro, if they performed as the best performer. 
So, day surgery development has been, for, has been fast in Sweden, as in many countries here. Here you see a diagram that shows that improvement already has been down. This is the proportion of day case surgery, that, and it shows um, how it has decreased, uh, increased from 42% to 61%. And this is an example of 11 surgical procedures. This has released approximately 80 beds. And then you know, even before, Sweden had the fewest number of hospital beds per inhabitant within the OECD family. So you can go from comparing performance to looking at performance and cost savings in a transparent way to make it even more concrete and easy to understand and to actually count what numbers in patient you need to work with in order to be the best performer. A few years ago, target levels were, was introduced on the national level. Target levels is one way to assess uh, the performance towards high priority recommendations in the national clinical guidelines. This example shows the percentage of non-smokers in the population of patients with type 2 diabetes. The target levels are decided by the state together with the professionals, patients, and the decision makers in the region. In this case, it's set to 95% or higher. This would mean that an additional 27 thousand persons in the country with diabetes 2 should be offered support in order to stop smoking. We are far from the target, but we know how far. We are now in Gothenburg, in this region, 5,576 patients more should be offered support to stop smoking. We have also measures from the patient herself that gives the same picture. Too few have been offered help to smoke cessation though we know there are efficient interventions to help the person in this area. So, the more you analyze, the more you con concretize performance assessment, the easier you, it is and the more use you can have of it as a support tool. So knowing how you perform, analyzing, making it all to concrete, supports action. But I can't stress that enough, without action, it's just nice to know knowledge. This support is on a system basis, but health is not about systems. It's about the person. A lot of good results in the Swedish system can be explained by a person-centered or patient-centered approach. Our legislation states that the patients are entitled to co-decisions, second opinion, information, and that it's up to the professional to provide for a good participation. One of our quality dimensions is to have a patient-centered approach. That means that you see the per person rather than the patient and that you acknowledge the capacity, the ability and the strength that are there even if you have health problems. Person-centered care is a partnership between patient, carers and professional caregivers. It's a shift from production to co-production, from production to interventions to supporting health, from the healthcare expertise to the individual's self-expertise, to abilities to achieve good health. Since person-centeredness means that patients and persons cannot be reduced to the illness set, illnesses, it takes a starting point the patient's experience or the person's experience of the situation. Well, person centeredness has become a big and very good trend, but this is a diagram, a graph of the trends. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, from one of our medical journals, and it gives you a good overview that trends, they will shift, they shift over time. And now we are in the value-based trend that you see. But I would claim this includes or are built upon a person-centered approach. So trends are shifting, TQM, scorecard, lean, etc. Uh, to some extent, not only the names, but also the content. But, may, but maybe I think we can learn from different trends. And one trend feeds into next trend. So I would say, with support from this graph that 
Trends is just another way for improvement of healthcare in a structured way, systematic way, with support from a theoretical standpoint. Seeing the patient as a person, acknowledging their abilities is timeless. And I would say a key to good results when it comes to health outcome. Person-centered care also stimulates innovation. And talking about innovation, many people would refer to gamma knives and high-tech hospital innovation. But the example I would give here today are more related to person-centeredness and the capacity that lies within every one of us. And it's also an area where Sweden has a good reputation. It's this kind of innovation. The roller, the security alarm, those are two good examples. This in, those kind of innovations changed his lives for many, mainly elderly women and men with health problems. The roller gives you independence, mobility, possibility to stay home, to live our day, daily life with good functionality. It's one of the most common prescribed assistive devices in Sweden. At the National Web Healthcare Guide, there is information about 60,000 products designed for people with disabilities. So we really try to involve the person when choosing assistive device to be informed when meeting the prescribing physician. Another type of intervention is how to deliver services. We have now launched a strategy in Sweden on how to be the best e-health country before 2025. Maybe some one other country has the same strategy? Are we competing here? No? Okay, we are going to be the best 2025. It's an ambitious goal. So, this is the Swedish youth clinic, but on the web. We have, of course, also traditional youth clinics that provide excellent service. <clears throat> but this clinic clinics has some advantages. It connects with boys, beside girls that doesn't come to traditional youth clinics. It's possible to be anonymous. It has a broad perspective on health, somatic health, love, reproduction, drugs, violence, mental health. And let's say I enter my teenage daughter's room, she will immediately click on that panic button. And that directs her website to some nice family photo. <laughs> So I would like to finish off this uh, second uh, section by giving you two examples from clinical practice on systematic ways of working with improvement. Dementia is a disease that, because of our aging population, is becoming increasingly prevalent. Besides declining cognitive functions, these individuals often experience behavior and psychological symptoms, BPSD, in dementia. This register started a little more than five years ago. Now almost all municipalities in Sweden use the registry, except for six of them. But the other 284 are using the registry. The aims are to improve the quality of care of patients with dementia in nursing home and ordinary homes. It provides a checklist for possible causes of BPSD. It offers evidence-based care plans suggestions to reduce BPSD, it evaluates the interventions used. There were no magic here when performing better results. With help of the registry, you progressed in a structured way, observed the current ways of working, made analysis, tried new interventions, and evaluated. You evaluated with help of an established scale. This improvement work involved a lot of facilitators, two and a nationwide, that were educated and in their turn educated others. The education was spread by certified educators. Tools were used when per, um, for personal contacts as well as networks. Yearly there is a one-day conference for all with workshops, lectures and inspiration and social media, media is also used to deploy these ways of working. And the results are spectacular. You were able to reduce the frequency and severity of BPSD reduced medication use, and it led to health professionals in nursing home working in an evidence-based manner and evaluating their interventions. And it supported the healthcare team to work towards the same goals and provided more safety for the patient. 
Another example from clinical practice, you know that increased use of ventilatory supports is linked to increased mortality. Shortening the time in the ventilator can also reduce complications. At the intensive care unit in Uppsala, 50% of the patients needed breathing support. During the time of the improvement project, several new routines were introduced. The team regularly checked compliance with point prevalence measurement, structure reviews of patient records, and by retrieving data from the Swedish Intense Care Registry. The project managed to decrease time on ventilator for all patients from 56% to 49 hours. In a subgroup of patients, the decrease was as much as 74%. So, trying to summarize it, it's about transparency and health system performance in a structured way. It's about systematic improvements, data for using them, not for just knowing, uh, not for just having the facts, and about person-centered care and innovations that stems from a person-centered approach. So, it's time for a short break and a moment of guessing. This is two technical devices, and those are results of government-funded projects. It should bring in, um, innovation to the healthcare sector. So the first one is connected to a security alarm. It's a refined innovation. And the second one weighs two kilos, and it can hopefully soon be steered by eye movement. Take some 20 seconds to think about what it can be, and I will ask you then. Okay, um, I have no microphone here, so I will ask um, Stig here, who is on the first row. Do you know anyone of this? Yes, both. Good. So you can tell us. The one to the right is when I'm having lunch and can't use my hands. That's right. He said the one to the right is when I'm having lunch and can't use my hands. Mm? And the other one? To take my pills at the right, right time. To take my pills at the right time. And it's connected to security. Very good. <laughs> so actually, I'm not surprised, because this is one of our duties to know all the uh, assistive uh, devices. No, it's, uh, it's Swedish interventions. And uh, it's called cutlery, or bestick in Swedish. And, and I would say that uh, a device that helps you with eating is really a supportive device in day-to-day -day life. And we're hoping for it to be steered by eye movement soon. It's also a Swedish company that works with that. You know, first section was a bit, a bit of bragging, but as you know, nobody comes without flaws. There are still many challenges for the Swedish healthcare system. The first one, but enriching and difficult, is linked to the situation of migration. The last six months, we have experienced a new situation in Sweden. We have been able to receive 165,000 refugees last year. The graph, this graph or map, shows the 10 countries in Europe that are the major countries of destination. The darker the color, the more refugees. Sweden was the country that received most refugees per capita. The number of persons applying for asylum in the European Union have now decreased, but still remains on very high levels. So that means that focus to some extent has shifted from the acute situation to the long-term perspective. Here you see the quick changes for Sweden before the start of this year. With migration come challenges on the short term and on the long term. Short term perspective highlights the occurrence of infectious diseases, but it was actually not a big problem compared to other health issues like mental health. Because for many infectious diseases, the incidence was somewhat similar in Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan as in Sweden. Instead, mental and dental health, for example, is a major concern. On average, 20 to 30 percent of those applying for asylum are considered suffering from mental health problems. 
among the underlying reasons are their experience from the migration progress, but also, of course, the war situation. By law, all incoming refugees have the right to health examination and evaluation. This examination is mainly performed by primary healthcare units. During the acute stages, there are a variety of different measures that has been taken from the regional level. Some regions have formed support teams for the healthcare centers that are located close to major refugee accommodations. In other, in other regions, mobile center teams have been established. These teams perform health examinations on site. Additionally, the refugees receive a brief introduction to the Swedish healthcare system. This has decreased the amount of patients that turn up at emergency units with non-acute health problems. Trauma teams have been established in some regions. For less severe mental health problems, health support groups are organized around the country with support from the national level, the SALAR. You select members to the support group by screening tool, and then you meet five times in the support group. This method is based on evidence and have a person-centered approach and take the basis from the person's abilities to heal him or herself. We know that this change in the Swedish society poses a demand on transcultural competence and a need to be person-centered. It demands to work with patients that are not familiar with the Swedish language and familiar with another kind of healthcare system. Knowing when to adapt to patients' wishes is, of course, crucial. I have to leave the practice without any medicine is one remark that is more common. New trends on unhealth, uh, especially for dental care, can be seen. We know that dental, care is, dental health is a big problem, and our dentists are facing health problems they have limited experience of. Increased need for psychiatric mental health services can also be expected in a longer term perspective. Approximately 25% of all asylum seekers are children. Since the children are entitled to all kinds of health care and adult family members are not, there is a risk that the overall provision of care to the families might be insufficient. 30 to 50% of all asylum seekers are women, and they represent a vulnerable group since they may have been victims of discrimination, physical violence, and sexual abuse in home countries or war zones. Apart from children coming here with their parents, there are children coming here without their parents. And when it comes to unaccompanied minors, Sweden received the most in absolute numbers, 35,000. 90% of those are boys. There are so many good examples on how to work. And one comes from the region of Värmland, who have a thorough strategy for, for example, dental care for unaccompanied minors in particular. This region has screening team, mobile prophylactic clinics, and has also developed specific guidelines for the kind of dental health problems that they foresee. Working with health on the web and to spread information on the mobile phone to young persons has also been important. Mobile phones is the best way to reach out to young persons and adolescents with health information. So that is the main media we are now using. Leaving the issue of migration, and now coming to the second challenge, coordination of care. I will just show you some graphs to illustrate the challenge with coordination in Sweden. In this graph, it's evident that Sweden are showing negative results on follow-up and trying to support the patient when shifting to another level of care. This information of the visits as hospital just about 50% received written information about the patient's self-care and when to contact the doctor in case of deterioration health, deteriorating health after coming home from the hospital. Here we are comparing to US and Canada and Germany and France and uh, Netherlands and some other countries. 
Another example, only 64% respond that the regular health personnel always or often have knowledge about the past medical history. This is a big problem since it means that you have to repeat yourself. You have to tell the healthcare personnel over again what your health problem is, the drugs you are taking, etc. We know for a fact that this is connected to risks and we know that the information system is a key to make a better performance, so we're working on it. 2025, as you heard, or before that. Yet another area where Sweden is not among the top scoring countries. Only 45% of the res respondents report that they always often are helped with a regular contact clinic to coordinate the care. They have no one in the healthcare system that coordinates the care. So you see, coordination of care, comparing with other countries, is a very good, um, good way for us in Sweden to know where we perform well and what we have to work on. So we have mapped this scheme showing what is uh, considered a coordination of care. And as you see from a patient perspective, no uh, repetitions there. No repetitions and assistance to take the next step. This is from our agency for analysis on healthcare systems from a patient's perspective. Third challenge is equity. Sweden is an equal country and we have low tolerance for lack of equity. The equity problem here is narrowed down to socioeconomic status. The higher the education, the better off. This is hospitalized patients. This indicator shows how well the healthcare perform when it comes to treating people for somatic disease that also have a psychiatric disease. There are differences in mortality, mainly depending on whether you have a psychiatric disease or not. In all, the healthcare sector in Sweden performs unequity depending on patients' education and mental health. So here we have a challenge. And finally, the aging population. The darker the color, the more severe illness, and the higher in the pyramid, the higher age. So you see here, in the future, we will have a, a big task here. But the aging population, that is a gift. It tells us how far we had come with welfare and with health. So I will end this in a happy tune. We will not die from accidents. We will die from diseases. That demands care, of course, often advanced care. And that demands research. It's very important. And also the help to self-help. And also to keep track of the individual. You are not the age. You are the person. And that should form the healthcare given in the future. So challenges that I would like to mention today, migration, coordination of care, equity, and the Asian society, as many of you have. Thank you very much.